idea to start learning the surahs which you already memorize and you already are familiar with and to break it down and to learn it from a grammatical perspective. So we are more heavy on the grammar and lighter on the tafsir aspect of it. Okay. Uh, second point, this class is less important than your first class. And the reason being is that if your foundation of grammatical rules are not firm, are not strong, then anything you try to build on that foundation is not going to be strong. Understood? So always make sure that uh, your homework and your review for the first class is done. And this will essentially help you and solidify whatever you are learning from the first class with the additional benefit of uh, having a deeper understanding of the surahs that you have been memorizing or you ha might have a little uh, familiarity with. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so if you look at the syllabus, you will see that there are three weekends that will have no tafsir class. Okay, so the, uh, those are April 19th, April 26th and May 24th. Those three weekends there will be no tafsir class, meaning you will have a double session of the first class. Okay? You will have a double session of the first class. Uh, one feedback we got from last term was that there was very little review sessions and that made it hard for the students to keep up. Okay? So what we have tried to do was incorporate more review sessions. So inshallah before your final exam, which will be on July 5th, uh, the date is subject to change, we, you will have at least three review sessions. So even if you feel that the material is getting too much, or that there are some parts of the surah that you have not been able to understand fully, then no worries that when the review session comes up, make sure you have your questions. And the only way you will actually know, the only way you will actually know that you uh, have questions or you have not understood anything is if you review it on your own first. Okay, otherwise you won't know what you don't know. So you will have three review sessions, which will inshallah uh, prepare you for the exam. Okay. Number three, uh, Salahuddin mentioned what surahs we would be doing. So we will be starting from Surah Humaza today and we will conclude Surah Humaza next week. And we will carry on and finish off with the first surah that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was uh, given, which is Surah Iqra. And that will be our final surah for the year. Okay. A little more about the class. What we do is recite the Arabic, uh, translate every single verse, and then look at every single word individually from a grammatical perspective. And then I will give you a little background of the surah itself and what the surah is talking about. Okay? So keep in mind that whenever we do talk about the grammatical perspectives, those are what you have to focus on for the most part. Any questions so far? Any questions so far? No? Alright, so, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yisir li amri wa hlul uqdatan min lisani yafqahu qali. Rabbi yisir wa la tu'asir wa tammin bil khair wa bika nasta'in ya fattah ya alim. Okay, so we are starting Surah Humaza. First of all, Surah Humaza is a Makki Surah. Uh, for those of you who are here, or um, those of you who have heard the term before, uh, the term Makki Surah means that the Surah was revealed before the Prophet Sallallahu migrated to Medina. Okay? Before the Prophet Sallallahu migrated to Medina, every single Surah that was revealed is called a Makki Surah. We know that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala Whenever he revealed a verse, he either revealed it because it was beneficial for the believers uh, without there being any context or 
when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed a verse, it was in response to an event. Okay? So, some verses, some surahs, they will have stories behind it. That this surah was revealed in response to this event. This surah was revealed as an answer to this question. Every single verse of the Quran does not necessarily have a story behind it. Okay? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also revealed verses to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam simply because they are beneficial for us. Okay? So, this surah has a certain story behind it, but more to do with the qualities of an individual. So, uh, whenever you open books of tafsir, you will find that sometimes there is a difference of opinion regarding whom the surah is about. Okay? Tabbat yada Abi Lahab bin Watab is about who? Abu Lahab. But there are other verses in the Quran, other uh, surahs in the Quran, which talk about certain people, but are understood only through other sources. Okay, so there's a difference of opinion on who the surah is about. A couple of the uh, opinions is Akhnas bin Shuraiq, that's one name. Walid bin Mughira, I will repeat the names, uh, Umayya bin Khalaf, or As bin Wa'il. Okay, so Akhnas bin Shuraib, Walid bin Mughira, Umayya bin Khalaf, and As ibn Wa'il. So the surah was about a certain individual who has few qualities in it. The third one is Umayya bin Khalif. Okay? Umayya bin Khalif. And As bin Wahid. That's the last person. The difference of opinion comes down to who the surah is referring to. It can be one of the four. It can be all of the four. It can be none of the four. The surah itself, you will see when we start the surah, is that it is very general. Anytime, anytime a surah or a verse of the Quran is very general, it can be applied or be applicable to any person. Understood? Even when surahs or verses of the Quran are referring to specific people, tribes, groups, or individuals, we also have to understand that if a person finds within themselves the same qualities, Allah is condemning in a certain verse or a certain surah, then that verse also applies to us. Does that make sense? Okay, so surah humaza, even though uh, the mufassirs have a difference of opinion on who the surah is talking about, we have to understand that the surah can be talking about any one of them or none of them. But what we have to understand is what's more important are the qualities that are mentioned in the surah. Is everybody clear on that? Okay, so we are starting with the surah itself. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Waylulli kulli humazatil lumazah. Okay, so the first word, wail. The translation of wail can be destruction, ruin, doom, woe. You know when you are essentially condemning a person? So Allah, when He condemns a certain individual or group, in the surah He is saying wail. Woe be unto those people. Destruction be on those people. The word wailun is a noun. And this is what I want you to focus on. Whenever I categorize certain words as prefixes, as verbs, as nouns, as prepositions, make sure you write that down. Because these are what's going to be part of your foundation when you are studying the rules itself. Okay. So wailun is a noun and it means woe, giving bad news to somebody. Likulli. Can somebody tell me how many parts is in the word likulli? Two. Two. Three. Three. 
three. It's two. It's two. Okay. So the two parts are the first letter is a part on its own. The lamb. The lamb is a preposition. The lamb is a preposition and it means four. Okay. So if you were to, for example, put this on the desk and you were to say, Li Zaydin. Hada Li Zaydin. This is for Zayd. You use the word lamb, you use the letter lamb to show that this particular object is for a person, a specific person. So when Allah is saying li kulli, the word kulli means everyone. Or every. The word kulli means every. How would you classify the word kulli? Is it a verb? Is it a preposition? No. Is it a noun? It's a noun. It's a noun. The word kulli is also a noun. So the word wailun is a noun. The letter lam is a preposition. The word kulli is also a noun. Okay? Translating uh, those two words together. Uh, woe unto every one who woe unto for every if you want to translate it literally destruction for every destruction for every everybody clear on that so far any questions huh there's a translation uh, destruction for every Destruction for every. Okay, so the word humaza and lumaza are very closely related. Not just in how they sound, but in what they mean. Okay, so the word humaza, if you want to translate it, you can translate it as a person who slanders. A slanderer. Somebody who defames. Uh, backbiting is the next word. We're getting to that. So this is where you understand that the Quran is very specific in the words it chooses to give a certain meaning. Okay, so we will get to that. The word humaza, the word itself means a person who slanders. Okay, now is that a verb or a noun? Listen to the translation. A person who slanders. It's a noun. Okay. So the verb is hamaza. Ha, mim, and za. Those are the three letters you will use to look the word up in the dictionary. Okay. The verb means what? If the noun, if the noun translates as a person who slanders, what would the verb mean? He slanders or to slander, to Sorry. defame. Yes. Um, you mentioned that the way you look it up in the dictionary is by the three root letters. Mm -hmm. I didn't know about that. Yeah, so different forms of the word are not going to be found in the dictionary. So each word mutates into a different form to give a certain meaning. Okay. So what happens is you take off the extra letters that give specific meaning and you come down to the root letters. You come down to the root letter and the root letter is what will give you the meaning. Okay, what are the root letters again? Ha, Mim, and Za. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Check it out. You guys should get dictionaries by now. All right. And anytime you come across a verb, have a 
have the dictionary close by or when you review your work, just to get familiar with how Arabic is categorized or how it is understood through uh, a dictionary, get into the habit of looking up verbs and nouns and things like that. All right. So the word humaza means slander. Somebody who slanders. Lumaza. The translation of lumaza is given as somebody who backbites. Somebody who backbites. Now, can you tell me what the root letter of the word lumaza would be? What are the root letters? Lam mim mim and za. Huh? Lam mim and za. La mim and za. Those three letters are the root letters. And that means what? Backbiting. Not back. So someone who backbites. Someone no. To no. backbite. To, to backbite exactly. So whenever you distinguish nouns and verbs, or you are taking out the root letters from a particular verb, make sure you switch the translation as well. Wait, uh, what is the? What is wrong with my? Uh... No, you said backbiting. Okay. Someone right? who backbites. Someone who backbites is the noun. That's the translation of the word lumaza. Okay. okay. But when you are uh, when you are looking at the root letters of the verb, now it's a verb. You won't say someone who backbites. You will say to backbite. Okay, because a verb gives you an action, not a person. So, Abish. yes. So the translation of the ayah would be all to every slander who backbites. Okay, so let's do the whole thing together, then I will get down to what's the difference between humaza and lumaza. So, wailulli kulli humazatil lumaza. Destruction or woe for every slanderer, backbiter. For every slanderer, backbiter. So, every single person who has these qualities within them fall under the verse. This is why the Mufassirs weren't sure if it was referring to a specific group of people or a specific individual. Because the uh, surah, the verse of the Qur'an, is general. Right? It's general. It could be referring to a specific person or a specific group but at the same time even if it does the Quran is universal the Quran is universal and whatever qualities Allah is praising a certain person or a certain group for and if you find those qualities within you that ayah is applicable to you Allah gives glad tidings of Jannah of paradise to those who believe we believe, so the glad tidings are for us as well. Allah is condemning those person, those people, or those individuals who have the qualities to slander and to backbite. And He is condemning them. If we find within ourselves those very qualities, then this verse applies to us as well. You understand how that works? Yeah. Okay. Now, what is the difference between slandering and backbiting? Are they synonyms? Are they used in specific situations? Yes. Um, backbiting is when you're specifically saying something wrong mm -hmm. about them in a negative quality or something. Mm -hmm. The slandering is when you could be doing in front of them anywhere, you're just speaking negatively bad things about them. Mm -hmm. um, I thought that backbiting was something that's true, and then um, that you say that a person wouldn't like, and slandering is something that is untrue. That you say that the person still wouldn't want? Okay. Anything? Okay, so whatever has been so far is definitely true. 
those are parts of the definition and our understanding of backbiting and slandering. But look at it from a linguistic perspective. The word humaza and the word lumaza, the differentiation comes in how you go about doing it. Humaza refers to slandering or backbiting somebody openly. Right? With your words, with your actions, you are not discreet about what you say about another person. You don't try to keep it on the down low of what you're trying to tell somebody about somebody else. You are open about what you say, you are open about what you do. Okay? The word lumaza, the word lumaza refers to doing something discreetly with motions. And if you look in the dictionary, you'll find specifications like eyebrows or winking. Because the word lumaza, if you look at the verb itself, it doesn't mean backbite. It also means to wink. You know when somebody walks in the room, you look over to your friend and you tilt your head, or you wink, or you raise an eyebrow, right? Wordless communication, but it is part of what you think of a person, right? It is part of what you think of a person. Does that make sense? Both are wrong. A person can say, oh, at least I'm not hiding it. I'm not trying to be a hypocrite, I'm trying to be as honest as possible and I'm trying to let that person know that I think of him like this. Still wrong. <laughs> right? The other one is, I'm, I'm keeping my opinions to myself, I'm not trying to cause any trouble, I'm not trying to harm that person, it's just between me and a person who I trust. Still wrong. <laughs> right? So Allah is saying that, you know, if you find yourself talking about people behind their backs like this, right, or you slandering people like this, then watch yourself, right? Get a hold of yourself. Everybody clear with that verse? Okay. So, Wade is a noun. Lam is a preposition. Kulli is also a noun. Humaza, Lumaza are also nouns but they come from verbs. Does that make sense? They come from verbs. The next verse. Alladhi Alladhi jama'a ma law wa'addada Alladhi jama'a ma law wa'addada Now here, if we look at the translation, you can say that the surah is talking about a certain individual or a specific group of people because this is a very uh, Scrooge like you know Mr. Scrooge there's a very Scrooge like quality of this verse the translation is those people who gather wealth and count them who gather wealth and count them So, alladhi, those people. The word alladhi is classified as a noun. And remember, even though when we are going through the surahs, and I classify a lot of words as nouns, don't think there's only one type of a noun. <laughs> when you guys actually start proper rules, you will see that there are many types of nouns. But there are nouns nonetheless. So, alladhi is a type of noun, but it's a noun. Alladhi. Those people. They who. Jama'a. Jama'a is a verb. Jama'a is a verb. And it means to gather. To gather anything in any way. Okay? We are gathered here. So we are called a jama'ah. 
When a person gathers wealth, he accumulates wealth. That is also called jama'ah. Malan, everybody knows this word. Mal means wealth. Okay. Wa'addada. You don't answer. Wa'addada. Don't answer. Wa'addada is how many parts? Four. A little too high. Two. A little too low. Three. <laughs> That's the only one left. Wa'addada. <laughs> okay, three parts. First part is wa. Second part is addada. And the third part is who. That ha at the end. Now, uh, the word wa or the letter wa itself means and. A N D, and. And in the translation, we said what? Those people who gather wealth and count them. That translation comes from the letter wa. It's a prefix, it's a conjunction. You want to get specific? Okay? Second part is what? Addada. Addada means to count. It's a verb. Addada. But it's in three parts though, right? Yes. So, wa is the first part. And then... Addada is the second part. Who is the third part? Oh. The ha. The ha at the end of the word is the third part. So, addada is a verb. Addada is a verb which means to count. Who, the ha at the end, is a pronoun. It's a pronoun. <clears throat> it is referring to the person who, what? Look in the verse and tell me what would that pronoun be referring to? Close. No. Not the wealth itself. What is the first action in the verse? Gather. To gather. So the people who are gathering wealth and counting the wealth, and he is counting the wealth as well. Does that make sense? Is referring to the same individual. Alladhi <laughs> is a noun. Those people. Jama'a, who gather. Jama'a is a verb. Malan, wealth. Wa, and. Addada, who. And he counts. What? He counts. Yeah, I was so confused about the last part. The who is like. Um... The who is a pronoun. Okay. It is an attachable pronoun. Meaning you can put the pronoun anywhere. The ha. The ha can come up anywhere. The word itself is adda. Okay. So say for example there was no pronoun at the end of the word, it would simply be wa So so the translation is those who gather well and count is it count what? What's being counted? The wealth. The wealth. So where is the he coming from? And he counts it. We don't have to say the he, right, in translation. We can just say and counts it, right? But where is that he coming from? Where is it being translated from? Fill in the blank. True, but... No. That has a pronoun. What is it referring to? Answer was given. Referring to the person who's gathered wealth. Alladhi jama'a mala. Those people who gather wealth. Wa addada. And he or who counts it. Oh, it comes from the verb. Oh, it's two it different person. Verb. Yeah. It comes from the verb. Not two different persons. It is referring to two different things. So addada, the verb itself, includes the person. Includes the person, right? Addada means he counts. So, so Allah is saying that this person gathers the wealth and he counts it? 
The ha refers to what's being counted? What's being counted? Wealth. In English, if I were to just translate the verse and say, those people who gather wealth and count it, what is the word it referring to? Wealth. The wealth. If I were to say, those people who gather wealth and count wealth, is that usually done? Oh, no. No. You replace the word wealth with it. Why? Because wealth was already mentioned once and you are simply referring back to it. So at the, the who, the ha is in place of the word what? Mala. It's in place of that. It is essentially referring back to a word. It's already. Wait, so ha can be translated as like it. Okay, yes, question. Um, would it. Is the who just like emphasizing that those, it's the... No, it's not emphasizing. The who is a pronoun and it's attachable. It's detachable. So it's telling you what it's referring to. Yes, exactly. And the only reason we can find out is because the word wealth was already mentioned once. Right? الَّذِي جَمَعَ مَالًا وَعَدَّلًا Those who gather wealth and count it. Now, why did it say Scrooge-like? Because we are gathering wealth when we work. We are gathering wealth through our professions, through our livelihoods. Counting is nothing wrong. We're not being told to be haphazard about our wealth. You count to make sure that everything is in order, that there's no misunderstanding. Right? If a person uh, gives you something, some things, say he gives you a stack of money and he says count to make sure that amount is there you are doing it so that there is no misunderstanding between you and that person and that if any issue comes up it will come right there and there you either have too much or you have too little so it can be resolved right there so counting in and of itself is not bad but this type of counting is called obsessively counting always making sure that it's there that it increased that it didn't decrease it's like Mr. Krabs you know I don't know if you get the reference <laughs> yes. it's like Mr. Krabs he's always counting you know dimes and qu you know penny he's a very very penny pincher right this is exactly that not only gathers wealth obsessively but he makes sure that it stays that amount or it constantly increases and to make sure he's always counting. He's always counting. Does that make sense? So they are gathering wealth and they obsessively count it. Bad quality. And the reason why I say obsessively is because counting in and of itself is not bad. Counting in and of itself is not bad. But to does the word indicate that? What? The obsessive part? Yeah. No, I think no, the word itself, Addada means to count. Okay. Means to count. But if you try to understand the meaning of the verse, right? And we are told to be uh, very, very careful in our business dealings and in money transactions from other verses, from other ahadith, then this Ayah does not make perfect sense when you look at the other verses and the other hadith, which tells you to be careful about transactions, right? So why shouldn't I count money? So the only possible, plausible explanation is that if you make it a habit, if you're obsessive about it, if you make it a goal in life to just gather wealth. Okay? Two more verses and then we'll conclude for today, first day. Yahsabu, is everybody clear on the ayah itself? Okay. Yahsabu anna malahu akhladahu. Okay, there are more who's here. So you'll get more practice. Yahsabu, yahsabu is a verb. Yahsabu is a verb. Can you tell me the root letters of this verb? 
Hasin and Ba. Hasin and Ba. Oh, you skipped the first letter or what? It's not always the first letter. This is where morphology comes in. When you study verbs and you figure out what changes a verb, you will find detachable letters. Okay? So, ya is one letter which changes the function of a verb. The root letter always stays the same. And even if the word gets larger, the, uh, the root letters are always within the word. Maybe not right next to each other, but within the verb itself. Okay, so yahsabu. Two things. They think. Who are they? Who is Allah referring to in this verse? Um, the slanderer and backbiter who gathers wealth and counts it. Yes, but more immediately is referring to those people who gather wealth and make it a habit of counting. <coughs> yahsabu. They think. Those people... Think, it's referring to the second verse. They think, Anna. The word Anna is for emphasis. It means verily. Did you give another um, translation for Anna? Verily. You can also say that. Allah said, Inna Allah Verily Allah is forgiven. There are different types. There's one Anna and there's Inna. <coughs> so, yeah, so what will be like a synonym, synonym for a verily? Truly. Surely. Truly, surely. Certainly. Certainly. Right? Yeah, Sabu. Anna. They think that, or verily. <coughs> The word anna is categorized as a preposition. Anna. Verily. Malahu. Okay, how many parts in this word? Two. Two. First part is mal. Second part is hu. They think, or he thinks, let's put it in the uh, third person. He thinks that Malahu, his wealth, Akh Ladahu. Wait, could you translate Malahu again? His wealth. They think, verily, his wealth, right? Let's, tra let's translate everything in the third person. The word yahsabu can also be he thinks. Okay. He thinks that his wealth akhladahu. How many parts in this word? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Two. Two parts. First part is akhlada. Second part is who. You have recited or have heard the word Khalidina, right? The word Khalidina and Akhlada share the same root letters. Khalidina means what? Living forever, right? Yeah. Living forever, to continue living. Akhlada means to make something live forever. So if Khalidina means immortal, Akhlada means to make someone immortal. Okay? Someone or something? So to refer to both. To refer to both, depending, right? In this context, it will mean okay. him. To make him immortal. Akhlada itself means what? 
to make something or someone immortal. Who is referring to what? The money. Mm, the one. No, money is already mentioned. It is referring to the him, the people. Person. Who the, get person the person or per the people, the person who gathers wealth. Right. Okay. So, Yahsabu, he thinks, Anna, that, Malahu, his wealth, Akhladahu, will make him immortal. Will make him live forever, yes. Oh, so, then who, how do you know when you're referring to the wealth to the person? Because when you look at the translation or you look at the context, referring back to the wealth would not make sense. Okay, so if we were to translate it as he thinks that his wealth will make his wealth immortal. Right? It doesn't it doesn't really flow with what we are trying to say. So what's the translation again? He thinks that his wealth will make him immortal. He thinks his wealth will make him immortal. So the reason behind obsessively gathering wealth and counting it is because of this feeling that wealth will somehow make you live forever. It can mean in different ways can mean literally that you want to have a lot of money so you have access to the best technology that will help you live forever. I can't remember the title. Hmm. Sarah Gates? No. That Bruce Willis movie that came out two years ago? That you're in a pod, you're sleeping, but your mind is in a robot. And that lives for you. So some weird concoction, right? Or fine, a more recent example, Elysium. You have so much money that you live on a distant place where there is no disease, there is no sickness, you know. Why? Because you are extremely, extremely wealthy and you can afford it. This is not talking about healthcare, right? <laughs> this isn't talking about healthcare, that you can afford medication for yourself. Allah is specifically referring to those people who want to live forever, either metaphorically or literally. And they feel that their wealth will be what makes them live forever. That if you have wealth, you will be remembered. If you have wealth, you will be remembered. You will be remembered as the wealthiest person ever lived, be remembered. At, I mean, think of it. Why is there so much obsession about uh, Forbes lists? Like, world's 